Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi Gemma, how are you today? I'm very well, thank you. How are you doing? I'm brilliant and thank you for coming on the podcast. I'm really looking forward to hearing your story and learning all about you. You you have a fascinating business and fascinating talents. Just before we we started, actually, we had a quick discussion because I shared one of your YouTube videos about growth mindset. And um, if we get an opportunity, I'd love to talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> with you. Um, but to get us started, um, can you tell us a little bit about you? So where were you born? Have you moved around? A bit about your education, your first job, uh, maybe about your career, although you look quite young, so you might not have had a long career. <laughs> and then also, you know, why did you get into what you're doing today? And then we'll mm -hmm. deep dive into your business and hear all the good things about that. So over to you, Gemma. Thank you very much. Um, the first thing that came to mind really is that I'm very much an accidental business owner, as I'm sure many entrepreneurs are. So I'll, I'll kind of start at the beginning and get to that point, really. Um, so I was born in Macclesfield in, in the UK and moved to Sheffield when I was about four. So my whole life, I've pretty much been in Sheffield. Wow. And in some ways, culturally was quite sheltered, you know, stuck to the same kind of area same groups of people we didn't really go yeah. on holidays abroad or travel much so that that was very interesting in my um I guess later teenage and adult years to suddenly see the rest of the world a little bit more but as a child very white working class area um I grew up in a family where there were two adults four children yeah. And I was the oldest of four, which I think has probably shaped my personality quite a bit. I give off a lot of big sister vibes and sometimes maybe over involve myself trying to mother hen other people. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there's a positive and there's a shadow side to all these kinds of things. Well, there um, always has to be somebody, a trailblazer, doesn't it? So the eldest is always like having to experience everything first um I, i'm one of four so i do and i'm the youngest ah. so i just i just observed everybody <laughs> yeah um and my siblings were all on the autistic spectrum in right. in varying degrees so that shaped a lot of who who i am and the way i operate i absolutely love education and I would come home from school very excited to kind of share what I'd learned, help them right. out. My brother had play therapy when, when he was young. And so in the school holidays, when we had um, the, the therapist come to the house and kind of do speech and language work with him, I would get involved. So from the, from the age of about eight, I'd already got in my head, I'm going to be a teacher, possibly in special educational needs because I want to help other people in that right. sense so so had a very clear direction from a young age wow. which, which might be quite unusual um yes and then absolutely love primary school secondary school was a bit more of a disaster in the sense that um I guess a lot of people will, will be aware of like the Hermione Granger archetype of student sort of, I've got all the answers, pick me, very studious. But the type of school that I went to was quite uh, working class in a deprived area. And so I got a lot of stick for the, you know, the way I, I wanted an education. And I perhaps was a little bit blunt with other people and insensitive to they didn't want to be there. Yes. Um, they were spoiling it for you, right? <laughs> well, that, that's how I judged it. And because yeah. I'd got this sense they were spoiling it, I could sometimes rub people up the wrong way because I was carrying a sense of injustice and, and yes. things like that. Yeah. Um, so when I went to college, I volunteered in a special educational school once a week and um, used to help out as a, a volunteer teaching assistant. I the the makings of my career really started when at college I I stumbled across a youth leadership program and right. it, 
it was quite odd, really, because I'd always been very academic, done really well in school, um, got into college, had in my head I was going to go to university. And at college, somebody said, oh, you know, you need more on your CV than just your grades. So why didn't you do some extracurricular stuff? Yes. Would you like to do Duke of Edinburgh Award or you could do this leadership programme? And I kind of thought, well, I don't really like camping, so I'll do the leadership one. Right. <laughs> and, it, and it was quite a mindless choice in some ways, but that was really a, a turning point in my, in my life. Um, so at 16 years old, I had a very small circle of friends, but was perhaps a little bit, I don't know if arrogance the right word, but again, the, the shadow side of that Hermione archetype is that a little bit self-important. I want to study, I've got my plans and I perhaps wasn't very patient with others. I, I wasn't necessarily very aware of the impact my communication style was having on other people. Right. And I could be a little bit, a little bit bossy and overbearing and all that kind of jazz. Okay. So went on this leadership program and learned about personality archetyping, goal setting, time management, public speaking. I was chronically shy. Like, yeah. you know, speaking to teachers and, you know, putting my hand up, all that kind of stuff, not a problem, but but sort of putting myself out there with other people was really difficult for me in the first few months of college I didn't really have any friends because my my school friends had gone to other colleges or, or moved elsewhere so I was quite on my own but yeah. by doing this program I learned so many I guess what you call soft skills yeah. all the stuff around employability but actually it applies to your personal life as well and it really just shaped my you know gave me a new view of myself and, and got me interested in the world of self-development. And okay. the gentleman running this program had said, you know, if anybody's enjoyed this, you can come back and volunteer to help other people. And that, right. that resulted in nine years of volunteering on, on youth leadership programs across wow. Sheffield. And I absolutely loved the, the, the reward of, thinking, you know what, this gave me so much, this has helped me so much in my life and I want to give back to other people. And yeah. all the while I was learning self-development tools from you know, Stephen Covey, growth mindset, all sorts of things that most yeah. people would learn in adulthood. I was getting in my early teens, as well as learning how to mentor, how to coach and how to deliver training which ticked all the boxes for I'm wanting to be a teacher. This is this is a fantastic opportunity um, wow. and it's really worthwhile. So just on on that then. So you said early teens. So how old were you when you went on that course? I was 16. That is very young, isn't it? Mm. And actually, uh, so Chris, who runs the program, is so generous and it's really he's, he's a good friend and colleague to this day and actually yeah. in, in many ways like a father figure to me because I've known him more than half my life now wow um but other opportunities would come up as well so at 19 he was running an NLP not a full accredited program but it was like an introduction to NLP for students so at 19 yeah. years old I was I was learning some of the basics of that which again most people wouldn't get until until they're in a leadership and management position so well, those well, kinds of things Gemma, were such a head start I didn't learn about NLP until I was 44 wow. <laughs> so, so you got it yeah you were exposed very early on mm. yeah yeah incredible incredible okay carry on this is yeah. fascinating so um so yeah, all the way through college, through university, I was volunteering um, on that. And it, it wasn't a full-time thing. It was a couple of weekends a year delivering training to other students and young people. Um, yeah. And then I guess in between what I was doing was kind of saying to Chris, oh, you know, we could actually write some handouts on this or we could make these materials or I've just read about this in my psychology degree, we could make an activity out of it. So over the length of that volunteering, yeah. I kind of gave myself a bit of a PA role 
of you know doing some extra admin work creating things um mm. and and kind of said oh I've got this idea for an activity can I do it so there was this this gradual progression from just being somebody helping out to starting to take a leadership role within the the staff team the regular yes. team which was really nice um so I did my psychology degree uh that went well came out of that with a first popped along across the road to to Hallam University to do my teacher training so right. you asked about where I grew up I'm pretty much you know lived my whole life in Sheffield did my degree yeah. at Sheffield University did my teaching at Hallam University and my mum did say to me you know do you want to go elsewhere <laughs> what why would I travel when there's two perfectly good universities it's here? all on your doorstep how lucky <laughs> so I I stayed at home and commuted which there's swings and roundabouts on the one hand you could argue it was a bit sheltered but on yes. the other it gave me the opportunity to save which I guess yeah. was quite important being from a low-income family where there were six of us I was quite mindful of, of managing yeah. the finances and you know just in case I needed to help out and things like that yeah makes sense um, so so yeah I, I I followed the path I got into teaching and I love what I love being around children I'd, I'd volunteered in schools for quite a long time all throughout my studies mm -hmm. and there's just something fascinating and joyous about helping people learn things seeing those penny drop moments but also children have this creativity and the the kind of social norms haven't set in so they question things in an interesting way or they challenge the the limiting beliefs that adults might have so I really enjoy yes. that environment mm. but when I got to school I, I kind of I did all my interview and had this portfolio of what I could offer and said you know I, I do all this leadership work I could teach the children juggling and emotional regulation and what it means to be a leader I'm interested in arts and crafts so I got the job because of what I could bring but then yeah. when I got there they were like maths and English and that's it oh. and it was and it was just the system was really draining and there was a a, a toxic leadership um well a toxic leader running the school 20 yes. staff left in the space of I think a year and a half I was only there a year and a half and the turnover for a primary school of 20 staff was just ridiculous very very um yeah just disempowering Sad. and yeah, yeah. and Sad. I think there's it, there's a lot of schools that have that kind of story so mm. there was there was another kind of key moment where um there were two family deaths in in short succession I was working a 70 hour week in school constantly being criticized for just general teacher stuff of why you know why is this paperwork not perfect why you know these kids are disagreeing with each other what are you going to do about it and there was just mm. there were so many things and it's like but that's not necessarily all the stuff that matters and if if you let no. people work on the foundational aspects of you know emotional intelligence and personal skills everything else would follow yeah um so having a bit of an intense time and then there was an opportunity to go down to London and do a residential leadership weekend and I thought you know what I'm really busy but it might refresh me yeah um so I went down and did the volunteering as usual and found that I was working with some some A level students again just on leadership skills in general and I thought you know what I've achieved more with these young people in a weekend than I have with my class over the last sort of 6 months yeah because we've got an environment that's conducive to change and because we can give time and attention to things that matter yeah this this is making more of a difference to people than teaching is so so I decided to hand in my notice, which was also a palaver. It took like three or four months to actually leave because they lost my resignation and stuff. Um, but I used mm. that that time to kind of work out how do I start a business? I've no idea what I'm doing. I'm an educator. Um, but but Krish and the other people that I volunteered with was, were wonderfully supportive. And they kind of said, you know, 
if this is something you're interested in doing, go for it. So Chris mm. lived in Sheffield the whole time I'd known him, but then moved to London. And I said, well, if you're moving to London, who's going to keep running leadership work in Sheffield? And he said, well, you know, you crack on and do it. You know, I trust wow. you to use the material. We'll work together on bits of it. Get going. So that was about seven and a half years ago now that I, I started my business, um, which began in, in youth training because that's where my passion was. Yeah. But has gradually evolved to work with different groups of people um, who are interested in personal development, leadership, well-being. So at the moment, I've got a big client group. I, there's a charity that I work with who deliver leadership training for refugees. Right. I do well-being sessions for, for individuals in corporate spaces. And I do a lot of work with student unions and their kind of youth leadership in unions, but also study skills and well-being for the student body. So I kind of dabble with a few different groups working on anything personal development, really. Incredible. I, I love how it all just flowed I mean, I know you had some upsets along the journey, don't we all? Mm. Um, but they're all there to guide us in a certain direction. I, I certainly believe that. And how all of those, I mean, how amazing was it that you didn't like camping? If you had gone camping instead, I'm sure you would have been great on the Duke of Edinburgh Award. I'm sure you would have been amazing. But it's that like split second decision. Mm, mm. No, nah, I don't like camping. I'll do this leadership stuff. Have a look, you know, uh, what that's all about. And that basically, that one decision just shaped the direction of your journey. Yeah. And here you are now, seven odd years later, and running your own business in an area that you love. Mm. Um so, you know, they always say, do something you love and you'll never work a day in your life. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. And that's why it's accidental. I never set out to own a business. It was just I found my passion mm. and, and mission in life to help other people. And running a business is just a mechanism to do that. It's so interesting because I've, I've interviewed people on this podcast um, before I interviewed somebody in December, uh, a young 21 year old running her own business. And she, she created this journal and she, she talks about that. Think about what you'd like to do that will help other people mm. because that's where you will get the most enjoyment and satisfaction from. And clearly, what you've done through all that volunteering, where you were helping people for free. Um, and, you know, I mean, I didn't even know volunteering was a thing until I was 44. Oh, wow. It was when I learned NLP with Tony Robbins, and he then talked about volunteering in, in his talks and everything else for this weekend that I went to. and that's when my personal development journey began, you know, mm. and that's when I realized, well, what's this volunteering? I've never heard of it. You know, I mean, it obviously was going on, but it wasn't on my radar, you mm. know? All right. So you, you're working with all of these different groups now that you've identified and obviously clearly still involved with the youth side of things. So you're still able to make a big difference to kids even though they might be bigger kids. <laughs> um, yeah, it tends to be over 18 for now, where because it's a bit easier to manage the safeguarding paperwork yes. side of things. But yeah, yeah. I, I still have a passion for that 18 to 30 bracket because I think it, the change has more impact the, the sooner you can make it. Mm. And that it's a lot easier to set somebody on the right path than it is to, I guess, backtrack with an adult and, and undo some of the, the <laughs> challenges. And yeah, back, 
baggage is a really good phrase but yeah. actually I, st I still you know I'll work with anybody who's interested so when I do work with adults I, I find it fascinating to compare and see the difference mm. um and yeah as long as I'm helping somebody the you know age religion background really doesn't bother me as long as they're really up for it I think everyone's the same and you know we never truly grow up do we we're, we're still big kids at heart. We just need to see the fun in life, I think. Mm. That's, that's what's most important. And if you were to kind of split the different groups, is it, is it a complete mixture and does it change? Or are you going to go, oh, well, 20% of my business is youth leadership and 20% is companies and 20 percent is charities does it split like that or is it just literally what comes up it's, it's kind of what comes up but it's also a bit seasonal so what right. I find is that the the youth stuff and the you know university student unions tends to to slot around the academic calendar so I'll get right. a flurry in January for exam season of kind of ah well-being as you're doing your exams or study skills yes um, and then sort of the the May through to August period is right you've just been elected as a student leader what skills do you need to do that effectively so so I get a lot of bursts of activity there for that the right. work I do with refugees is, is year long because it's quite a long program that goes into yeah. depth over time. Um, and then the corporate stuff, I'm, I'm working with a, uh, a networking community called This Girl. And we do monthly well-being sessions for, for individuals to kind of drop into. And I get sort of a few knocks on the door from another collaborator to say, right, you know, we're doing our company well-being month or well-being week what what workshops can you come and do for us so I think it's sort of yeah there's, there's peaks and troughs for certain things as, gotcha. as there are things in the calendar such as mental health awareness day I tend to get a mm. flurry of, of workplaces wanting to do things around that mm. um, and then it might quiet down at other times and then yeah. in terms of the charities um, I there's a few regular collaborators there that might say, right, we're running a residential for interfaith youth in uh, Switzerland or Bahrain or India or, you know, there's, there's different countries that I've had the opportunity to travel to to run a lot right. of the programmes, yes. um, which has been a, a real joy to, to broaden my horizons and, and kind of explore cultural differences, but also just see the common humanity in yeah. a lot of these self-development skills yeah absolutely and of course as we're speaking right now at time of recording there's a massive refugee crisis going on in the world at the moment mm. and we will have a lot of refugees arriving in the uk so you might be getting a bit busier over the mm. coming year or so unfortunately mm. i mean fortunately that they'll get some help hopefully from you um but yeah the circumstances is not great yeah. okay um all right so let's get into a little bit of detail then um i'll just ask a really open question it says what are the kind of things that you help people with oh so again i'm i'm not very good at niching i know everybody in the world of proper business tells you like find your niche and, and kind of market to I don't that, agree. but I guess I don't agree I, I agree with you <laughs> um so anything about developing personal skills is roughly the remit so yes. on the more on the more technical end of that that might be learning time management leadership models conflict resolution non-violent mm -hmm. communication public speaking so the the more concrete this will help me with my job kind of end of things yes um but i i always bring in a um i guess a holistic element to it so that even when we're talking about leadership skills you are a whole person that has a personal life a, a sense of spirituality perhaps a physical body 
your own values and beliefs and that's going to play a part so where where I have seen other people kind of chalk and talk and say right this is the the one way you've been told to do this this is the model that you have to follow this is what you should do I prefer to give people a toolbox and you know my attitude is here's a menu let's experience these models rather than me just telling you about it you know let's do a lot of simulated activities let's try them out yeah how does that feel for you how does that sit with who you are as a person how does this show up in your personal life so there's always a reflective element to to the topics that I'm teaching yeah um and I think that probably comes from my primary school background that you know if you're teaching kids just telling them is no good at all you have to show you have to do you have to reflect so I always bring that in so that's kind of the the more employability work focused end of things but I'm also very passionate about well-being so I I do a lot of stuff around positive psychology and I guess when people think about well-being what jumps to mind for them is oh I've got depression or anxiety or I have this problem slash disorder and I want to fix that that's not my remit that's you know that's for a medical professional But what's interesting is that there's so much research out there about the things that everybody can do to have a happier life or to feel better in themselves. So I do things with people on understanding identity and developing a sense of purpose, fostering gratitude, challenging limiting beliefs, developing self-esteem and confidence, strengthening relationships. And so putting things like that together for people helps them to I guess just feel better in themselves gain a burst of energy give you know have a sense of direction or self-assuredness that Mm. that may well then feed into work if that's why they wanted it but if not it's about just serving that person as an individual and I think part of the reason I'm passionate about that is because that that's what I got from doing the leadership program myself although it was sold to us as this will help you get into union get employed the the subconscious stuff or the the less obvious stuff about self-awareness and just knowing who you are what you want and how you want to show up in the world I felt made the biggest difference to me so so it's always my angle even if I'm asked to do something quite academic shall we say or formal I'm like right where can I get that personal angle in in there because that's the transformational part for me yeah I I like that you said holistic and then again lots of people don't know what it means you know when you say holistic they kind of go oh well I'm going to get it am I going to get a massage then (laughs) yeah they worry you're going to make them do yoga or something yeah Exactly. And the thing is, we often forget, don't we, that there are practical things we need to learn, like toolkits and, you know, kind of go, well, you know, B follows A and C follows B. And, you know, hopefully you'll get to Z. But if you don't, then go back to the beginning and do it Mm. again and just practice and practice until it becomes muscle memory. Mm. Right. Great. But underneath, underneath it all is our mind and it's our thoughts, you know, the things that we think about that are not true mm. <laughs> for 99.9% of the time. Uh, and how do we deal with that? Because even if you've got the toolkit, if your mindset isn't, you know, in the right place, if you're... It's not even a mindset if your attitude or your Mm. you're not even realizing your conditioned mind, you know, because it's often people are automatic pilot in terms of reactions to things because they've been conditioned that way and have conditioned themselves that way, too. I mean, Mm. certainly that's what I've learned in my kind of you know, in, in the more recent part, it's the conditioning of our mind that plays such a massive role in how we react to things and how we behave. I know about myself, mm. you know, 
I know what I've done and I do reflect on it now more so than I ever did. Um, I, so when, when you're helping people with the, you know, if you're doing some training around the toolkit part of it, when you say, well, how can I get that personal bit in, the personal development angle in, how, how do you do it? How do you manage to then wangle it so that people then start to see that side of themselves? So I think the key for me is the, the awareness raising. Um, you kind of, if you try and teach somebody something cold, they kind of go, oh, well, what's the point? You know, I don't need to learn this, especially when you're working with adult audiences who, you know, yes. a, a fun one might be listening skills. If I, mm. the amount of times I'm asked to cover listening skills, if you just walk into a room and say, hey, everyone, I'm going to teach you how to listen, people are like, get stuffed. I'm a grown up. <laughs> I know how to listen. So, so you've got to have a hook that makes them see that there's a need. So mm. I, I, I like to do what I call baseline activities. So I might go, you know, welcome to this training session. Let's get started with a bit of an energizer. And I know people, can sometimes resist energizers as an icebreaker. So you've got to be careful how you frame it. And that's yes. one of the fun things about working with the younger end of the spectrum is they're a bit more up for it on the whole. Yes. Um, but as you said, adults still have that inner child in there somewhere and they can get They do. It. They do. But I love simulations and problem solving activities that normally have a bit of a, a trick to them or an angle that means something goes wrong. So you might yes. say, oh, just have a go at this activity. And it's a, and they don't realise it's about listening, but really it is. And it's designed in such a way that they're probably going to mess it up and they're probably <laughs> not going to listen. They're going to make loads of assumptions, get it wrong, and, and it'll yeah. be a delightful disaster. <laughs> and that's really good because then you can go, oh, okay, so, so what happened there? How was that for you? And people kind of go, oh. Yeah, I didn't listen very well there, did I? <laughs> or, oh, I assumed they meant this, and so I ended up arguing with them. And and by using a bit of a coaching approach of, you know, I'm not going to tell you what I've seen. I'm going to ask you, what did you notice about yourself? What did you notice about others? Mm. And, and that can work. If there are positives, let's celebrate them. Yeah, these are things I'm doing well. These are my existing strengths. And so I know that, okay, they've got that bit down. I can fast forward on that, but I don't need to cover it as a skill set. Mm. Um, or, okay, you've noticed that this is a challenge. What impact does that have on you? And this is only a game. This is just our energizer. It doesn't matter. Yeah. But what about when you're at work or in your personal life? Does the same sort of thing happen? And what, what's the consequences there? And we And it turns from, you know, a playful icebreaker or whatever it is into something that can be a little bit profound and people realize patterns and limitations and kind of go oh yeah I really like to do something about this well I've got a tool for that do you want to practice it and then we go into the models and so a lot of the way I operate as a trainer is that there's an activity an intro a simulation to raise self-awareness to generate buy-in so that I can then say right now here's the theory here's the tool let's practice it in group situations let's reapply it to the same or a different scenario let's evaluate was that how did that compare to the first time what have you developed okay now what's your action plan going forward and yeah. then depending on how much time I've got with people you know we rinse and repeat the process yeah. of, of layering on more tools, more practice, and, and ensuring that that self-reflection is there throughout. So mm. instead of just being told, this is what you should be doing, write it down, go away and do it. it yeah. It's very immersive and experiential because that's how you tap into the personal. I love that. I, you know, I, I've never... Well, I shouldn't say never, but um, oh, what's it called again? The oh yeah, the Ebbinghaus curve. Have you heard of the Ebbinghaus curve? Uh, the name sounds familiar, but yeah. I can't think so what it is. If you go on a training course, or you go to a lecture, or 
for a long weekend or even a day or even two hours or whatever, or watching it on Zoom, if you don't do anything with it the next day, you will forget 80% of it. Ah, uh, right. You just forget it, right? Mm -hmm. And then next week, you've probably forgotten 100% of it. Or you might hold on to like 2% of it. Yeah. And it's just a curve of remembering your memory if you don't put it into action mm. and start repeating it and start creating a habit with it, you, you, you will just forget it. It will goes. I mean, it's there somewhere, but you need to work hard to get it back. Yeah. But when you engage the physical, um, the whole body, so you've got to do an activity, you're engaging all of your nervous system, let's put it that way, then the memory, the neurons will be created because of that experiential, that kind of physical element as well. So it's much harder to forget. Not only that, because you've been involved, and I teach this in storytelling, once you've been involved, your whole physical body's been involved, you are creating new neural pathways mm. that will hook on to other things that you know yeah. from the past, create a new neural network, and it starts to hardwire the minute you start doing physically something. Mm. And once I, once I learned that, I'd learned about myself because I rarely did well at school, but I only started learning once I left school, once mm. I discovered at the age of 44 personal development, I became a lifelong learner. Mm. Rena, my growth mindset accelerated at that time because I realized that I missed a lot of my education, but not the kind of education that I needed, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, to sustain myself in a happy life for the rest of my life type of thing. So the fact that you're doing is long, a long explanation, but the fact that you're getting people involved from the get go into a game. Oh, yeah. If there's an emotionally charged event, that's what I was going to say. Mm. What, so when people engage their emotion, when they're doing something, even if they are having an argument with somebody in that exercise, that's an emotionally charged event that hardwires mm. straight away. And you never forget those. Yeah. You know, so when they think about the thing that they've learned, let's say it's listening skills, they will remember most the point that they had an argument with somebody. <laughs> yeah. And it's such a motivator for people to, to want to make a change and do things differently. And from, from my teaching background, it was always a frustration when I, saw other people's approach to training and, and I guess knowledge transfer of, all right, we've got this problem. People aren't talking to each other well, leading well, whatever it is. Okay, we'll yeah. just give them some knowledge. It's mm. like no, knowing is not the same as doing. No. And, you know, most of us on paper, if, if we were asked to write an essay or a bulleted list of how to listen, we know what to write down. We, you know, we know give our full attention, don't make assumptions, don't judge. We could list it all off. Yes. But knowing it and doing it are different because doing is a skill and it requires translating that into action. So I think what, what I'm passionate about in my training is bridging that gap between knowing and doing and giving people a motivation to, to spend time practicing. And for, for some skills like conflict resolution, you know, in a classroom setting, in a training room, if I say, right, this is the model, let's walk through it and, and practice it, it's easier in that training room than it is when you're actually having an argument with your yes. colleague. Or, or So you've got to practice skills in that safe environment so that when you're in the environment that's more challenging, you've already done that hard wiring and you've done some of the work. Yes. Um, you know, it's like riding the bike with the training wheels. You've got to do that a little bit first before you take them off. Otherwise, you just fall straight over. Yeah. And, 
you mentioned one of the things you do is public speaking. It's exactly mm-hmm. the same. You know, when I started to learn about public speaking, never had any training on it until, again, I was in my mid 40s. And I went to Toastmasters where you're in a safe environment with everybody who's learning. OK, and maybe there are different levels of of experience or fluency but you're in a safe environment with people who are all trying to do the same mm. and you're getting feedback that is put po- that is constructive feedback yeah. you know but you can't practice that in the workplace or no. you know in the public place you've got to you've got to find a safe space to be able to practice um, and public to speaking hardwire. is such a difficult one because if you think about the key moments in our life when public speaking is required, they're all high stakes environments, job yeah. interview, presenting yourself, sales pitches for the products that maybe your livelihood or business depends on, yeah. exam like doing a research viva, this is my project, and you're being assessed on it. So most of the times when we're asked to deliver public speaking come with a high risk. So it's no wonder people find it scary and end up avoiding it. But when I'm training people on public speaking, I said the only real way to get over that is to practice to the point that it becomes boring. You know, use this safe space, as you said, to get it wrong, to do it over and over again, because the more we repeat tasks, the less the less they are emotionally charged for us because they, they start to normalize. And if we're getting that encouragement, feedback, if we're feeling an improvement in our performance along the way, that then develops the confidence. It replaces the the fear and maybe the imposter syndrome that we had with evidence that, oh, I can do this now. Um, Yeah. Yeah. And again, I think one of the, another slight reason for me leaving teaching was that there's no space in the curriculum for this kind of stuff, but it's really important. And it, it's mm. a real shame that some of the things that that make a difference to people aren't dedicated time, partly because of policy makers, partly the head yes. teachers, but also individual teachers may not know how to to kind of allocate time and, and how to teach these things. I know I I often share a video when I'm blogging about things. And I'm so sorry he passed away. Recently. Oh, Ken Robinson. Care you knew who I was going to say. I know the video. It's it's a gorgeous video. Do schools kill creativity? You know, and it is such a shame that the education system around the world, not everywhere in the world, because there are some people in India who teach creativity as a you know primary subject mm. uh, rather than just English and maths and. Yeah, English and maths are important, but the creativity is even more important because you couldn't even do English or maths if you weren't creative mm. to begin with. You know, uh, I my maths sh- sucked at school. You know, my English was amazing because of help of my mother, who was Anglo-Indian. So I learned English at home to begin with. But it, you know, still not the best, my English, not. It's now my first language, but it wasn't for many years, you know. Mm. I I still struggle with the wordle very often, (laughs) every day. Uh, So, okay, I'm really fascinating, Gemma. I I love everything that you're doing and your knowledge on the topic. Um, I I promise we would revisit growth mindset. So, um, and I watched this video on your YouTube channel, which was just like, seven minutes introduction into you know a fixed mindset and a Mm. growth mindset and i know i'm putting you on the spot a little bit but could you share a few nuggets on growth mindset because most of our listeners are small businesses and Mm. i think it's a really important one for them yeah so um As a bit of background, it was developed by a lady called Carol Dweck, and there's a lovely book if people want to to read up on it. And it's got lots of illustrative examples, which which may be helpful. But basically what she did is she looked at a load of people who were well known in their field. So musicians, dancers, sports players. um, And she noticed there was this pattern between people who kind of 
really shot up in their their skills talents reached a peak and then just suddenly stopped and yeah. and either gave up uh, or trailed off and then there were people who were slower to start mm. but they gradually kept improving kept improving and and never really packed it in or or had a problem and right. so she focus down and wondered what's the difference between these two groups and she boiled it down to mindset so I'm not sure if I fully believe in the idea of, of, of skills and talents I guess I'm not sure that we're born with things that we're innately good at because there's mm. environment and, and other stuff but it may well yes. be that say at the age of 12 you put a lot of practice into art or dance and so you're ahead of other people and people yes. might go, oh, you're a prodigy or you're really good at that. That's your talent. Yeah. And those people might get a sense that I am good. You know, and it's binary. I'm good or bad. I'm bad at maths, but I'm good at dance. And so I'll be mm. a dancer. Mm. And they dance and they do really well because they've got this head start because of their talents. But then as soon as they hit that, um, you know, that first dance show where oh, I'm not good anymore, I was mediocre. Oh, mm. now I've moved from good to bad. I'm no longer any good at this. There's no way I can get better than I am. You know, you either are or you aren't. And so that's it, I'm stopping that, I'm retiring, I'm not doing it anymore. Yeah. And that, yeah. Was, that was a classic pattern for the fixed mindset is this idea that, that we're binary. Things, we're either smart or dumb. We're yes. either good at this or we're not good. Whereas mm. the growth mindset people recognize that you can grow. You know, I, I may find dance difficult, but with time and practice, I can get better. Yeah. And so they put in the time and practice and they yeah. gradually improve and improve and improve. Mm. So at its core, the main thing about mindset is whether you believe that whatever skill, knowledge, talent it is, is, is kind of fixed. You either can or you can't, mm. or whether you have a belief that you could get better with time if you really want to, and if you want to dedicate um, your effort to it. Right. And there's some, there's some other elements to it as well. So there's kind of characteristic behaviors. If you're of a fixed mindset, you might be worried about how you look, how you come across. So if you were a tennis player and, you know, you were asked to, you know, you're in the top spot and you're asked to have a match against the person in the second spot, you might think, oh, I don't fancy that one. What if I lose? Yeah. Whereas, whereas somebody of a growth mindset might think, you know, I'm only going to get better by challenging myself against other people who are good. Yes. And so they might be up for challenge, whereas a fixed mindset person might pick easy wins yeah. and might avoid the challenge because they don't want to look bad. They don't want to be seen to fail. Yeah. A growth yeah. mindset person doesn't really use the word failure because they realize that that challenges are, are just a feedback process. Yes. Um, and another thing that can come up is kind of fixed mindset people might avoid feedback. They might be jealous of other people's success. There's, there can be a lot of social comparison that's unhealthy. Yeah. Whereas a growth mindset person may actively seek feedback from other people as you know constructive what could I do better yeah. what what went well what what would you improve and yeah. if they see somebody doing better than them they go this is great they can be my mentor I'll learn from them yeah. I'll read their books I'll, I'll you know see what their techniques are and so it's a lot more um I guess it's about nurturing and fostering whatever that skill set is um mm -hmm. and I think the Two kind of key points that I hammer home when I'm talking to people about this is that we can be fixed or growth in different areas of our lives. Yeah. So, so for the longest time, I would say I'd have a fixed mindset about following directions. I'd just say, I, I can't do directions and maps. And I would flat out say, like, when people start telling me, oh, yeah, you take this turn and then three instructions in, I've already lost it. And I've, I'll just say, I don't do directions. Yes. Which is not technically true. I'm, I'm still not very good at it. But mm. in my growth mindset mind, I know 
if I put the time and effort into learning how to remember directions, I could get good. Yes. I'm just not going to. So, and that it's a subtle change, but it, 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 it's important because there are so many people out there that may believe I'm no good at drawing. I'm no good at maths. And the subtext is, and I never will be. So there's no point. Mm. And so the growth mindset is really about saying I could get good at anything if I want. Yeah. If I put time and effort in now, the amount of time that it might take me to learn to be an astronaut. Do I want to take that time? Do I like it enough? Yeah. No, I'm not going to do it. But mm. at least I recognize I could. And that that makes a big difference. I, you know, um, what happens when you when to, going back to listening. Most of the time people don't listen properly right and the reason for that is not it's not a bad thing either because when they hear the words and the explanation of something in order for them let's say me to make sense of what you've just said mm. i have to reference examples in my own life and my own experience in order for me to connect with the words that you're saying you know, and there are so many things currently in my life. Well, not that many, but there are quite a few where I can see that I've been in a growth mindset or a fixed mindset. So I even recognize that I'm fixed on this thing, mm. but I'm not on this other thing. So quick example, I took up um, Japanese taiko drumming in 2018. Now, I used to play the drums when I was a teenager, but I gave it up when I was like 20. Mm. And I regretted it forever. Met a friend, new friend in 2018. He told me he was doing taiko drumming. I said, what is that? He showed me. I went, oh, how can I do that? I want to do that. Yeah. And I started in 2018 and the journey continues. And I started slow and I couldn't do it very well although I have a rhythm natural rhythm inside of me I used to play the drums conventional kick drumming taiko drumming is totally different and I would say now I'm pretty advanced at mm. it. but you know it's almost it's like three and a half years on you know did it through through lockdown and everything else at home as well so a really good growth mindset example because I wanted to do it. I yeah. love drumming and I wanted to learn and I practiced and I get something back from it, you know, because it just, it just lights me up. Mm. And I noticed when you introduced that, you said at the mm. beginning, I can't do it very well. Yeah. And, and the, the subtext there is this is where I'm at. I can't do it well yet. Whereas a fixed mindset person would just say, I can't do it. Yes. And full stop. Yes. So I think that the way we talk to ourselves about what we can and can't do makes mm. a big difference. And even if we don't say it out loud, the subconscious is, is kind of playing around with it. So the yeah. fact that you kind of said, OK, I can't do this well, but you're excited. And as you said, it lights you up. You've then got that passion to put in mm. the time and effort and grow to the position you're in now, which is where you're very advanced. Yes. And then you've, you've finding your video before our interview has really helped me. And I don't mind sharing this, but one of the things I do is whiteboard animation for companies, for little adverts for their businesses, little storytelling adverts, but via through lockdown, I wanted to master 2D animation, which I've always fancied, but felt I couldn't do. So mm. I immersed myself in boot camps and training learning, and I got funding even to, to help me with it. But when I then was released on my own to kind of get on with it, and there's a certain thing I want to achieve with it, I got stuck. Mm. I lost confidence and I found myself in a fixed mindset. So what I did went, okay, don't give up keep going. I know what I can do. 
I've had some funding, fine, but now I'm going to pay the teacher who taught me and I'm going to ask him for a coaching session. Mm. So I booked a coaching session with him, but then I still wasn't ready. I hadn't done enough learning by the time the coaching session was coming up. So I delayed it. Mm. Um, and now it's coming up next week and I still don't feel I'm ready for the coaching session. I'm like, shall I delay it or shall I go with it? Or I don't know what, you know, so I'm kind of going, why haven't I continued learning since for the last three months or so? Because I have this fixed mindset that feels like there are so many people out there who are so much better at doing 2D animation. I've been comparing myself with all the YouTube videos that are out there. And I'm like doing all of the things that a fixed mindset does. Mm -hmm. I became overwhelmed with how many examples I saw that I went, there is no way I would ever be that good. And I just stopped. I froze. Yeah. And I didn't move forward. But I'm pleased to say <laughs> that because of your video, I've, I'm going to reverse it. I'm going to go back to a growth mindset on it and go small steps. I can do this. I know I can. I have done it in the past with other software products and I've been successful at it where there was no experience involved before I started. Um, so, yeah, I just want to say thank you because you've really helped me break through. It's clearly seeing that I was in a fixed mindset about it, mm. but I'm no longer in that mode. Oh, thank you. And it's really lovely to hear that that's been a help. And I think one thing that you said that I wanted to just emphasise there is that where you were looking at other people's examples and seeing, you know, their end product is so much better than I could ever be is a classic fixed, you know, a motivator to give up, basically. What's the point? This is futile. Yeah. And what we sometimes fail to recognise is how many hours of practice have they put in yes. to get to that point. And, and this, I guess, social media does encourage us to compare in ways that are quite unhealthy. Um, mm. And people only put their best foot out on social media quite a lot of the yeah. time. You know, this is, yes. this, these are the successes, not the mess I made along the way while I was learning. And so it can be very difficult to, to move away from the way of thinking of, okay, I've got to get from zero to a hundred in one go, instead yes. of just recognizing, okay, I'd just like to be better than I was yesterday. What's the one mm. thing? And that's the difference with the with a healthy growth mindset is that you can learn from other people, but at the core, you're saying, where am I at? And what's my little step for today? Because, you know, 10 little steps over 10 days means, okay, you've, you've shifted eventually. And it's, it's yeah. not about being a perfectionist off the bat, which I think a fixed mindset person, because they're in binary, I've either failed or it's perfect. Yeah. And they find it very hard to see that there's, you know, there's a, there's a wobbly line to success. You don't get there in, in one go. No, no, absolutely. No. And I know that with every, even with podcasting, you know, I've, that was something I had no idea how to do six years ago. And I just went, right, I'm going to immerse myself and learn this and I'm just going to have a go. Mm. And I'm still doing it six years later and can see myself doing it, you know, for a very long time. I have no reason to, to want to give it up. Yeah. Um, so fascinating, Gemma, really, really fascinating. Thank you so oh, much. I, I love, but I've, what, I've, what I recognized as well, that you can be in a growth mindset about one thing and be in a fixed mindset yeah. about another thing. Yeah. And another point as well is that, so, how do you say I I'd like to think I'm in a growth mindset about everything you you yes. tell me any skill any knowledge and I know I could do it if I tried yes doesn't mean I'm going to though that's the no. other, that's the flip side is it doesn't mean we've only got so much time and energy and yeah. you have to choose what things to give that time and energy to. So yeah. as a business owner, classic example, especially for a small business, I'm doing the training, I'm doing the accounts, I'm running the website, I'm writing the marketing, I'm contacting clients. And, and the, you yeah. know, there's all these parts to a business. 
Yeah. Some of them I'm really good at and I take to quite naturally. Others I've learned and some, good grief, it's an effort. And it's, yeah. and I know I can do it with time and effort, but actually sometimes it's easier to pay somebody else who's already good at that because yes. that frees up the time and energy. So one of the, one of the pitfalls of growth mindset is accidentally buying into the myth be trying to get better at everything but actually lean into your strengths for the areas that are a challenge to you decide is it worth getting better at that so I would argue if you're not very good at listening that's a skill that actually everybody could benefit from a bit of growth mindset that one is mm. universally useful yes but do but do all business owners need to be video editors you no know? no not necessarily if that if you take to it and it becomes a strength, lean into it and use it. But the, when I tried to open up a Photoshop video editing thing and I did a workshop because I was growth mindset, like I'll give this yes. a go. And then after the hour and a half, I just thought, you know what? This is going to take me so much more time and effort than it might take somebody else because this is not my natural area. I'd rather just pay and have the time back to spend on something else. Yeah, And I think that that can be a challenge for small businesses to overcome is trying to do everything instead of leaning into the strengths and finding support on the weaknesses. And it doesn't mean you're fixed. It just means that you're you're being clever with your time. Yeah. But oh, and the good thing about having done the course on video editing, you have now learned what is involved with it. Mm. And therefore, even if you do give it to somebody, you can give them good guidance for starters. You can give them ideas of what you're looking for and you can look at the finished product. And so say, I think you can do better with that. Or can you can you take this out? Can you add this? Or you know, it's having having gone on the course will have opened your mind to what's involved. Mm. I mean, I. um did some I did a lot of voluntary work for my taiko drumming teacher during lockdown because he had no technical knowledge how to do his teaching online mm. so I helped him from ground zero to hero where he was teaching like 40 50 people every week on taiko drumming that normally oh, would have come to his in-person classes mm. um, I was also editing and producing all of his tutorial videos taught him how to record them on his phone mm. which was high quality and i did a beautiful tutorial video as well in addition to the zoom replays and everything else that i produced and then i could not really do it anymore voluntary i said i you know i've got to build my own business which i've ignored mm. for the last 18 months two years you've got to do this on your own now. Then he started doing the video editing himself and he said it took too long. So we've gone from a beautiful product to now perhaps not such a beautiful product because he's now doing a quick Zoom recording for the yeah. tutorial video. So the quality has gone down. It's still fine, you know, for yeah. the students. It's absolutely fine. But it just showed that it's not his skill. And he mm. then realized how long it takes you yeah, know, to do yeah. it. Um, so it's similar story to yours. Um, we're not necessarily, we can do it. We've learned how to do it, but we don't necessarily want to do it and mm. rather pay somebody else to, to produce it. And actually you mentioned this thing about drawing and I, I, I can draw <laughs> mm -hmm. and I do some drawings uh, in fact, all my blog post images now are my own drawings. I started do, doing oh, wonderful. them. Only very simple, stupid, small drawings. But I went, oh, I'm, I, I was getting images from different websites. I went, oh, no, let me just do a little doodle drawing. You know, yeah. it might stand out. Anyway, um, but I used somebody who's really good at drawing to create my animations because his quality is just so much better than I would ever be able to produce. Mm. Yeah. And that's where you get the lovely intersection between people who may have 
a natural strength or talent and a growth mindset on top so that they keep getting better. And that's when yeah. you end up with excellent product services, yeah. um, you know, and people really doing amazing things in the world. Oh, it's a hundred percent because I, you know, when I was doing my animation, I used clip art and that was okay. But over time you kind of ran out of stuff that would be specific to what the customer wanted. Mm. When I now use the, the graphic designer, my designer, he can create anything I want, you know, in a drawing. And then I use uh, good audio quality voiceovers and yeah, the product becomes so much better than mm. it could have been previously. Yeah. hundred percent. Right. Gemma, we, we could talk for quite a while about this <laughs> stuff. This is super engaging and I've learned a huge amount from you. So I'm really super grateful. Is there anything that I've missed that I haven't teased out of you? Oh, I don't know. I, I, as you said, I think we could we could go on for ages. I don't yes. think there's anything essential, as it were. No, um, nothing essential. But what is essential is where can people get hold of you? And do you want to share your website and some other social sites? Yeah. So people can find me on LinkedIn, Gemma Perkins. My company is called the Self Leadership Initiative, uh, which I've shortened to the SLI.co.uk. Right. Um, and there's there's kind of space on there for people to check out resources, links to the YouTube videos and things like that. I've got a gratitude yeah. challenge on there for people who are looking to develop their well-being. And I'm also doing uh, individual coaching as well if people want to, to book in a consultation and see about that. Instagram, I'm at, at self-leadership one. I think that covers most of the socials. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll, all the links will be in the notes anyway, if people want to check it out further, but I've thoroughly enjoyed our discussion and yeah, I've spoken a bit more than I would normally do, but yeah, the subject matter is so interesting. So I really appreciate it. And if you're ever coming down towards Birmingham way from Sheffield, then um, give me a shout and I'll, I'll buy you some lunch. Oh, thank you very much. And thank you for sharing your examples, because I think that that brings some of the content to life, doesn't it? When you can hear how, how somebody's really using these ideas to, yeah. to think about things in a different way and make changes. So, no, I've really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you very much. All right, Gemma. Take care and I'll speak to you soon. Bye. Bye for now. Bye. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests, so do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.